My name is Leonard Brand. I'm a professor at Loma Linda University. Um, my PhD from Cornell University was in evolutionary biology, and then uh, because of changing interests, I retrained in geology. So my research for the last 30 years or so has been in, in geology and paleontology. My reason for, for trusting what the Bible says begins, of course, in my confidence that I have come to have uh, in the Bible. Uh, but also, as I do research and study, uh, I find more and more reasons, even from science, uh, to believe what the Bible says. My faith is not built on science. It's, it's, on, uh, it's based on the Bible. But God is using science to give us new information that encourages us. From my studies and my field of expertise, I learned, first of all, that God is an amazing creator. Uh, part of my study has been in biology, and living things are just awesome. Uh, but also, as I studied paleontology and geology, I find that if, if I keep my mind open to the possibility that, that God, what God has told us about history is true, if I keep that option open, I find uh, evidence that, that supports that and gives me many reasons to trust in our Creator. I've never uh, been employed in a secular institution, but in my graduate school, uh, my professors were, were, of course, not believers. Um, and they knew that I was a creationist, but they respected me because, I guess, because I, I did well in my classes and in my studies and my research. And one of my professors said, I don't care what you believe as long as you have reasons for it. So that, has, that worked out well. Uh, in my research over the years, I have often worked with, uh, with atheists, with non-believers, and they, they don't see things the way I do, but as we've come to work together and they learn to, to see that I do good science, they respect me and my colleagues. I don't preach to them about my belief, but I just live my life and do my work well, and they, they know something about what I believe, and they do respect me. We've never seen a global flood, so we can't give a complete answer. But we do, uh, can, we can suggest some ideas uh, of why that is so. Uh, if you were to inundate this earth, the first things to be buried would not be the monkeys living up in the forest, they would be the things living uh, in the sea. And that's what we find first in the fossil record. And as you, as you go up in the fossil record, you find creatures living from other habitats, probably a higher elevation, so that's at least the beginning of an answer. It doesn't answer everything, uh, but it, it does give partial answers. Also, we would expect that creatures living in the water, say, would be affected by the, the chemistry of the water, the temperature, and many things. And probably different species would, be, would have different levels of sensitivity to changes in those things. And so that would affect whether or not they're going to survive or not. It, the order of fossils in the record looks superficially like evolution. But discoveries in biology in, in recent years have really making it uh, harder and harder to see that Darwin's theory of random mutations uh, would make significant changes. And uh, those are very strong evidences. And consequently, it's harder to believe that the, the sequence is caused by evolution. It must be the result of some other factors. It is often stated that creationists could not possibly be good scientists because uh, their belief gives them a bias, uh, a, a distorted point of view. Well, that's not quite fair. Any worldview can affect how one does their research and could introduce biases. 
However, uh, the important thing is how one relates to those points of view that we have, to those worldviews. I read a lot of anti-creation material. It is evident that the people who write those really do not know anything about how an educated creationist thinks. They do not understand how we think, how we do research. But it's obvious since they don't understand how we think, they understand their point of view, they understand their worldview, but they do not understand ours. I have an advantage that, that most scientists do not understand, and that is that I understand my point of view, my worldview, and how it affects how I think. But I, in order to do research, I have to also understand their point of view. I have to understand their worldview and how they think. I have to know as much as they do. I have to know how they interpret evidence, why they interpret it that way. And consequently, I understand both worldviews and how it can affect my research. And my friends and I regularly think about this, these two points of view, and try to think about how can we find something where we can test between those. And so we're looking at both options and seeking to understand the difference and how to test between them. And this actually gives us a level of objectivity that we, couldn't, we would not have otherwise. When little creatures are living in the water and living in the sand and the mud, they burrow through the sediment and, and leave traces and burrows, that's bioturbation, what they're doing to mix up, stir up the sediments as they make burrows and trackways. That's bioturbation, and it, it matters because uh, today, if you look at where sediments are being deposited, creatures burrow through it very rapidly, and if new sediment layers are deposited in, in a short time, even days, weeks, months, perhaps, um, they will thoroughly mix up that sediment and homogenize it. And if this was, if there is any amount of time at all, that's what happens. Now, if the rocks, the sediments, if the sediments forming the sedimentary rocks were accumulated very slowly over long periods of time, that process should thoroughly mix them and, and stir them up and probably eliminate all the, the boundaries that the divide different layers uh, of sediment. But we don't find it that way. The sediments generally are, are seen in distinct layers with clear boundaries between them. So there has not been enough time for that process as it should happen. Um, there are other factors that can uh, reduce the amount of bioturbation, but they're not nearly significant enough to change the fact that those rocks have, have not, um, should have far more bioturbation than they have. And so they, the, the lack of bioturbation speaks for rapid deposition of sediments. The, the standard traditional interpretation of microevolution is that it is evolutionary changes within a species, limited to within a species. I find that not a very useful definition because the kind of changes that produce maybe new genera are the same as processes that, that can happen within a species. And these days, not all evolutionary biologists interpret it that way. There, there is another way that some of them interpret it, and that is that microevolution are small changes, certainly below the family level. Macroevolution are large changes that would produce um, new orders, new uh, classes, new phyla, those are the major changes. So that, uh, that definition of microevolution and macroevolution is, uh, I find, more useful. The small changes and the very large changes that would produce, if possible, uh, major categories of organisms. Sedimentary layers can be deposited clearly one on top of the other without any disturbances in between them. Um, other times, between those uh, layers, there are lots of evidence of, of time and changes, like erosion, carving um, canyons and valleys and other things. There are some of those gaps 
that look uh, fairly even, like there's not much happening between them, but yet various evidences lead to the interpretation that a lot of time passed between those two layers. But, but you don't see evidences of that. Those are what are called flat gaps or um, paraconformities. And those are of interest because if one layer was deposited and thousands of years passed, or even millions, there should be a lot of changes happening. There should be erosion, shaping that into hills and valleys and canyons. There should be a lot of bioturbation through the, through the sediment. You should have a lot of things like that happening. But if you see a place that it has a more or less flat contact, perhaps some erosion, but not very much, it doesn't look like there was much time. It really doesn't. The idea that, that thousands or millions of years passed between those layers is hard to justify. So it must have happened rapidly. According to Darwinian evolutionary theory, any change that happens has to begin with random mutations. They have to be random because if they're not random, if some change happens because it would be useful to the animal, it looks like somebody is, is mon monkeying with the system. Somebody is, is behind that change. And Darwinian, Darwinian theory cannot have that happening. It cannot have any intelligent involvement in changes that happen. Okay, epigenetics comes in now. That's a epigenetics is a, a relatively recent discovery. Epigenetic changes are changes that are that not involve mutations. They're not random mutations. Epigenetics is uh, factors within the cell that uh, control how the genetic information is used, and that those epigenetic genetic changes are often changes that are not caused by mutations, there's no random mutation. They are changes that uh, are initiated uh, by the cell sensing. Epigenetic changes often have three characteristics. One, they are inheritable, even though they not, are not based on mutations. They are, um, they are not random. They are often initiated by, uh, the, the, by a sensory information from sensing by sensing of the environment and what is needed to be changed, to be helpful to the animal. And so something that is happens because it will be useful, not random, it's inheritable, um, that's a problem for evolution because it looks like there is intelligence somehow involved in this system. I think not. That's partly based on my, my worldview about Earth history, that it was not uh, hundreds of millions of years. We don't know exactly why they don't work. Uh, I, we can say that uh, radiometric dating is not kind of an absolute science. There is no instrument you could invent that could take a rock and tell you how many years old it is. What those instruments measure is the ratio of parent elements and daughter elements that have changed from it. Uh, so our instruments measure those ratios. Then one has to make some assumptions and calculate an age. So it's not an absolute science. But still, uh, we don't fully know how to explain it, but I, I uh, believe that they are not accurate dates. The idea that, that science can explain everything is based on a worldview that starts by rejecting the creator. But that's not realistic in, in actuality. Um, how did life begin? There are various, there are theories about how life began, but they're, uh, they're very incomplete theories. Really, biochemistry does not help us to understand how life began. It, uh, in fact, all the evidence is actually against it. The idea that life could begin without a creator is based on an assumption, not on evidence. The evidence is all, is all against it. Uh, even in, in evolution, 
uh, once you have life. Darwin's theory was developed in the mid-1800s. They knew nothing about molecular biology. They knew nothing about genetics. Um, if his theory had been suggested now, with all we know, I think nobody would accept it. New evidence is making it harder and harder to believe that the Darwinian theory of random mutations can actually produce major changes in animals and plants.